Devils, and welcome to another episode of the Pro Hockey Pod, episode 34. Uh, last week, we took a break from a union guy, so I thought this week we'd have to bring another one back on. It's been a common theme, as I've said, a lot of union Dutchmen on here. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had Kyle Bodie on. This week, we got his brother, Matt. Very happy to have him. Another guy that went the college route, still playing now, has played in various leagues, whether it was AHL, KHL, SHL, and now going into his fourth season in the DL in Germany. Also a guy that's been known to be a leader, you know, wore a letter a lot of times in his life and as well, won a national championship with the Union Dutchman. Welcome to the Pro Hockey Pod, Matt Bodie. Uh, thanks for having me. So always take it back to the beginning. Um, you were born in East St. Paul, Manitoba, Canada. Um, is that where you first like kind of learned to to love the game and start playing? Yeah, for sure. Um like you said, I got the uh, the brother there, Kyle, a couple of years older than me, so it's always about uh, keeping up with him. Uh, he was in, into hockey from a young age, so, you know, my earliest memories are being out on the rink with him, and, uh, you know, our dad built a rink in our backyard every winter, so we were able to get on the ice quite a bit. And, you know, luckily uh, to grow up where we did in terms of uh, being able to get the skates on whenever we wanted. Do you think, like, a big reason why you kind of were drawn to the sport was because of, you know, your brother Kyle, obviously seeing him go through it and you were just a couple of years younger. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I got three boys now and I can see the younger guys you know, mimicking the older one. And uh, I think that was pretty similar to, to our path growing up. Uh, even the way our hockey careers kind of panned out, uh, I kind of just followed in his footsteps, which, you know, made it a lot easier on myself. Yeah, I was going to say, we'll get to that uh, down the road because you guys played with each other multiple times throughout uh, throughout your careers, which is obviously, I think, cool cool to say you've done when looking back. But, uh, you know, your minor hockey path, like I talked to Kyle about this too. Obviously, um, you guys played on a couple different teams there in the in the Winnipeg area, um, the Sharks and the Thrashers. But he he talked about one thing, and I didn't know this when, when you guys were growing up, but once you get to that kind of older level, whether it's uh, – minor midget midget like if you want to leave you there was some rule i forget he was talking about you had to like finish high school before you could technically leave the the province to go to another junior league correct yeah um well, first off i'd say like the 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 minor hockey in winnipeg was really good when we were playing there i'm, I'm sure it's still good you know there's, there's a ton of kids that are playing and uh, the talent level is pretty high um but yeah so when when the rule back when we were playing, it was you had to be finished with high school to be able to leave uh, junior A out of province, right? So at 17, if you want to play junior, you had to play in Manitoba or the WHL. Um, <clears throat> so that kind of led me to stay another year of midget hockey because um, at the time my brother was on BC and uh, – both of our goals was kind of to get a scholarship, and, you know, play hockey in the States. And we, we felt that the BCHL was the best route in Canada to, to do that. And uh, so that, that's why I stayed the extra year in uh, not a total midget there. And I asked your brother the, the same question, but I'm curious kind of your answer. Like you just brought up, obviously you guys had these goals, you know, whether it was BCHL and then eventually NCAA, but obviously the, the WHL is a very, popular uh tier two uh major junior league sorry in in western canada like had that path ever kind of crossed your mind or you just you know with talking obviously with your brother seeing what your brother was doing in the bshl you kind of were just set on you know the NCAA route yeah i mean i think for sure most kids are, are looking at that whl route especially when i was growing up um and it's pretty crazy to think like 13 years old i think uh you play that year and the draft year in the WHL is at 14, right? So you're a lot of guys are really young, still developing into their bodies. Uh, for me, uh, I had the opportunity to play in the WHL after my last year of uh, midget hockey there at 17. So it would have been my 18 year old year, but I was pretty set on going the, uh, the college route. Um, but for most kids that I played with, the, the goal was to get to the WHL. And a lot of them were able to achieve that goal. And some went on and played after. And, and some were done by, you know, 19, 20 years old. Were you, uh, would you say you were kind of a, 
a late developer, like whether it was in terms of like skill or size, is that kind of also like a thing where, as you mentioned, like the draft is so young, you know, at 14 years old, like these, these clubs are picking guys to, you know, basically predict where they're going to be in four years, evidently when they're 18. Yeah, I I think so. Um, Definitely body size. I I was a late developer in that sense. And even now I'm still, you know, one of the lighter guys on almost every team I played on. Um, But I think it was just kind of a maturity thing too, you know, being ready to leave home. I I think leaving home at 16 is, can be really tough on some guys. Um, Leaving home at 18 was, it was a lot easier. I was a lot more ready for it. Um, And I, I think with any kid playing hockey, you got to just be at a level where you're actually playing. You don't want to get to the next level too quick and and not actually play, right? So I think that was a big part of my path as well is, uh, you know, playing pretty well at whatever level I was at and then moving on to the next one. And you mentioned too how you played, you know, you ended up playing the two years of, of midget there. And one of the cool things I would say is, you know, you got to play in one of the most elite tournaments for that, uh, for that age group, which is the, the TELUS cup. And, um, you end up being also the TELUS cup MVP. Uh, just talk about that experience. Cause that's like that tournament itself is a, I think is a rare tournament for, for people that age to get to, cause it's a lot of, you know, a lot of playoff series and, you know, back in minor hockey, at least in Ontario, it's like three different sets of tournaments before you can even get close to that so like just talk about your experience and and that year in general yeah um we had a great team that year um we had some great coaching uh kevin benson was the coach for the thrashers at the time and he did a great job you know preparing us uh it's really special year we we actually went 40 and 0 in the regular season and then 9 and 0 in the playoffs in manitoba so we were we were a bit of a wagon that year and then uh you know, we suffered our first loss, uh, the last, the last round robin game of the regionals. And, uh, we got to play that team in the regional final and, and we were able to win in uh, double overtime to make it. So, you know, it was kind of a storybook, uh, season to get to that TELUS cup. And then, uh, unfortunately we lost the national final, but you know, the experience and the ride the whole way was, was fantastic. I think everyone on our team, uh, benefited from you know not only how good we were as a group but some of the the media attention we were getting throughout the year kind of prepares you for what comes next at the junior and then the pro level as well yeah i think that's that's very true and just quickly looking at roster a bit of a wagon i mean mark stone on the team so uh obviously a guy that's uh, had a pretty good career just won a stanley cup but um so after that year you know your brother's already playing uh, in the BCHL, as you mentioned, in Powell River there. And um, I'm curious, you know, going into your first season of junior making the jump, was there lots of interest from multiple teams in the BCHL or had you kind of had your sets on, I want to I wanna go play with my brother because I've heard so many good things about the, the organization in Powell River? Yeah, I, I was going to follow my brother there. Um, I'd actually gone to their uh, their training camp the year prior. Um you know, me and my dad took my brother out for the year. Um, and they, the coaches at the time said, you know, like, why don't you, you skate with us? And so I went through training camp and they had said to me like, yeah, you, you, you make our team. So, you know, if you go back and play another year midget, because there was still the opportunity to go play with uh, the Celtic Steelers and the MJHL for that season. But, um, the, the coaches in Powell River said, you know, play play another year midget, and then we, we'd love to sign you for the next season. So I kind of knew going in um, that's where I was going to end up, hopefully. But um, it's not really something I had focused on at all until, you know, the end of the year there. Seems pretty cool, you know, obviously getting to play with your your brother there. And I think, too, you know, just hearing probably the experiences from him, as I mentioned, like he talked about uh, his coach there. He talked about how, what a great experience it was, you know, living away from home, which would prepare you that kind of style the BCHL is prepare you for the next levels, whether it's, you know, tier, uh, major junior NCAA or even pro, because you obviously are, you know, it's treated like a professional organization, organized uh, league as well. I'm curious when, when did you, so when you made the jump to that league, I mean, you had two very good years in that league and it seemed pretty easy the adjustment I would say just on paper but when did you start getting uh you know interest from from division one schools um 
Well, the, the first school I'd ever talked to was Bemidji State, and that was um, still when I was in the Manitoba uh, Midget League there. Um, and one of their assistants at the time said, uh, you know, my goal is to, to bring some of the top college eligible players from Manitoba. Because like you said, a, a lot of guys my age were in the WHL at this point already. A lot of the top high-end guys from my, my draft class, if you want to call it that. Um, so I talked to them earlier and they kind of kept tabs. But um, I guess, you know, probably – probably pretty early on. I, I don't quite remember, but I would think like right after the exhibition, because a lot of college coaches come and watch all that stuff, right? Before their seasons kick off. So I, I think we'd started talking to some, some teams pretty early on, but you know, my brother was fairly deep in the recruiting process with the union and they, they'd kept tabs on me or, you know, at least introduced themselves to me, but it wasn't a thing where, you know, we're only taking Kyle if Matt comes too. that they were very respectful in, in treating our recruiting processes very differently and very individual. So respect them for that. And I think deep down, I knew I was, I was going to follow him to kind of whatever school he was going to choose um, if I could get there. And uh, you know, luckily things worked out for us. You mentioned a cool point there, like the, so I believe when Bemidji would have been talking to you, they would have been playing in the, the four team, whatever division it was the AC ha which yeah, yeah. or something like that yeah so like that was my freshman year at niagara we were in that division and you know they were trying to obviously build for the future because they were going on to the another division i forget which one with all the minnesota teams or whatever but i mentioned to kyle too like a lot of those schools so whether now i guess it'd be atlanta like they they have to recruit early because if there's anybody that is good and the other teams get a sniff of them like they're not going to be choosing you know a Bemidji or a Niagara over you know a Union or a Cornell or something you know what I mean yeah it's a you know funny you should mention that because uh I had started talking to Bemidji when they were in the, I believe it was a CHA or CCHA whatever it was and then um by the time I was kind of getting ready to make my decision I think the next year they were going to the uh NCHC or whatever it was the, the Minnesota one you were mentioning and uh, they kind of just said to me, like, yeah, we have to change our recruiting style now that we're going to a uh, quote unquote better uh, conference. And so I was like, all right, like if the interest level isn't there, let's uh, kind of move on. And then I ended up seeing one of the assistant coaches uh, years later at a college hockey Inc. Uh, event. And they kind of just like, yeah, I think we made a mistake there. But, you know, it's nice to look back on. Swing, swing and a miss there. Um, no, that's funny. Um, one thing else I want to talk to you about kind of while we were still in your junior career there, um, you know, you got to do something cool. I, I got to do it too. I was the year before you is, you know, represent your country there, go to the, the world junior A challenge. Um, so you were the year after me, uh, and you end up going to this tournament and, you know, winning a silver medal, I believe, like, like just talk about that experience. Cause obviously, you know, for those listening, you know, the world juniors is, is obviously the top one. And that's normally, you know, guys who are all playing the OHL are already playing NCAA. And then for the guys who are playing tier junior still, you have the world junior A challenge where you have two Canada teams, but again, it's USA and then all these other international teams, but um, where was your tournament? And yeah, like how was the experience being able to, you know, wear your country's uh, colors? Yeah. So we, we were in a uh, Summerside Prince Edward Island, which was awesome because uh, you know, I'd never been out there and I'd never been, back to Prince Edward Island since, but, you know, for, for that week or 10 days, however long the tournament was, it was, it was an awesome experience. Just, you know, loved our time there and the people we met were great. Um, the, I guess the tournament itself or the, the you know, the whole experience was completely unexpected. Um, I came off a pretty good year. Um, my, my rookie year in the BCHL and really didn't think anything of it. And, the next season at the start, I got a call saying, you know, I've been invited to this junior A challenge trial camp. And I thought, wow, like that's, you know, that's awesome to hear. But again, I didn't expect much out of it. And, you know, I was lucky enough to, to make the team and be a part of it. And, uh, you know, again, it was very disappointing losing the final, but uh, what, a, what a great experience for any, any junior hockey player for sure. And another cool thing that happened at this tournament is, you know, you, you end up, I don't know if it was for the first time, you end up meeting one of your future 
union teammates there and, and, and Daniel Carr, who's been on this podcast. And it's funny. I just, I think it's funny how these paths like always cross and just like looking at your roster, I see three or four guys who are still playing now in Germany, whether it's in the DL or, or Dell two, like, so these guys have, you know, found a way to, to make it. And obviously, you know, you had a lot of good guys on that team. Um, but back to you, just kind of that last year, uh, there in the BCHL, like, when did you eventually, you know, make your decision? Uh, you know, I'm going to, I want to attend union college. It was pretty early on that year. Um, so we were doing an exhibition tournament in uh, trail. Um, and, you know, the, I think there was like, you know, four or six teams from the league that were there. So there's a lot of uh, college college scouts there as well. And I remember Nate Lehman, who was the coach of union at the time, was actually at the tournament. And, uh, we, we had chatted quite a bit. And then uh, he basically said within the next couple of weeks, we'd like a decision just because, you know, schools have – they got to move on to the next guy if, if, if you're going to say no. So – I think it was probably two or three weeks into the season. I, I gave my commitment to union. Do you think too, um, you know, you're obviously this, you know, this year of junior, you're 19 turning 20. So you basically you have one year of junior left if you had decided to stay, but do you think because you went at 20 years old, it was ended up being probably better for you in terms of being ready to take the next step to, to the NCAA level? Yeah, I, I certainly think so. Um, I remember uh, the option was there to to kind of go in the same class as my brother to Union, but I really didn't think I was quite ready. Um, and then that that last year of junior for myself, I was able to play, I don't want to say like 25 minutes a night kind of thing, you know, playing power play, penalty kill, all situations. So you're developing – you're developing those kind of skills, which, you know, if you, if you sometimes rush that next level and say you're the seventh D starting out, or maybe even the eighth or ninth D, it's tough to get in the lineup. It's tough to get the, the playing time to develop as a player. So I wanted to make sure I was ready. Um, we had a great team in Powell River too. We, you know, we made it to the finals both years. So it was, uh, it, it was a really good decision on my part, I think, looking back. Now, when you make the, make the jump to union there, like just, you know, obviously we, we played a game against each other when I was at Niagara there. Um, and just like looking in general, just kind of over your career, but especially that first year, like it seemed like, you know, not to say it was an easy adjustment, but it didn't seem like it took you uh, too much time to to get adjusted to the league and kind of, you know, the school athlete uh, mentality there, obviously, you know, you got most points by, by a rookie in your, in your division that year. Um, how was that first year for you? Like, you know, cause obviously it, it is at times, you know, whether it's in terms of the hockey level or kind of the lifestyle of balancing school and then, you know, being an athlete as well. Like how was that kind of jump for you? Uh, it was a bit of a challenge for sure, but like, I, I, I think I was better off than most guys simply because I, I had my brother with me, you know, so I could kind of bounce ideas off him. Um, we were very close in college, still close to this day. So uh, I think I had an advantage over most other freshmen coming into to college hockey, having, you know, your brother right, right there by your side. Um, I also knew uh, Daniel Carr from not only from the world junior eight challenge, like you mentioned, but he was traded to us in uh, Powell river my last year junior. So we knew each other going in, we ended up being roommates for four years. So, um, the comfort level off the ice was there. And I think that translated on the ice as well. Uh, I was also very lucky to, to play with our captain. He was my D partner for the year, uh, Brock Matheson. And he was just kind of, you know, I want to say like the picture perfect pro. He just uh, went about his business, you know, probably the hardest working guy on the team at every practice, every game. And just a guy everyone really respected. And, you know, having him, on the ice with me almost at all times was uh, definitely beneficial as well. Definitely a good guy to have as your D partner. And I, I just noticed, and I, I just talking to guys before, like, you know, Troy has been on, as I said, Dan has been on juice has been on your brother. Um, you know, it felt like union was just kind of taking the right steps in terms of, you know, every year taking a step forward in terms of the team, but also like recruiting. And like, I think the, the stats speak for themselves, you know, in your, in your first three years there, we'll get to the last one eventually, but 
you know, you guys are the ECA champions, you know, two years in a row there, I believe your sophomore and junior year. And it just seemed like you guys had this bond that I've mentioned so many times, like it just, it was just so different from, you know, a lot of other colleges, just kind of from guys I talked to, like, uh, I don't know, like, can you comment on that? Just like how the bond was like, so, so deep with you guys? Yeah. I mean, I think off the ice, you know, you're living with some of your best friends, um, especially at, at Union at the time, it was basically for four years. There weren't a whole lot of guys that were leaving early. You know, some of the, some of the top programs in the, in the nation are bringing in guys for a year or two, and then they're out the door to the NHL or, you know, the AHL, whatever it may be. I think with us, we, you know, we were able to spend four years together and almost every class before us was doing that as well. Um, and then, you know, just the things you go through off the ice in the, in the weight room, the workouts, um, you know, some of the, the party events you're doing in the spring, you, you, you develop some really strong uh, friendships. And I think that really helped us on the ice as well. I 100% agree. As I said, the bond was crazy to hear about and also to see when I, I, I came down there one time and just it was, you know, very family like atmosphere. And I think that's why you guys had so much success, so much success. But Speaking of the workouts, we're going to get to that because this is always a great topic. Um, the famous spring workouts. I think I've asked this question five times on this podcast now, but, uh, you know, before we get to your senior year there, obviously you had three, probably three summers there, or three springs, sorry, of the, of these famous workouts. And, you know, each guy has kind of shared their own memory of them, uh, how it pushed you guys both, uh, physically, but more importantly, mentally, I think. And I think it mentally prepared you guys to be able to handle anything in life, you know, whether it was on the ice or in the classroom or down the road, but anything you want to share about these workouts, any moments that come to mind? Well, you start with the night before, you know, uh, you knew you had these workouts and guys would just be nervous going to bed because you didn't really know what the workout was going to be. You know, you'd say you'd hear at the rink at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m., whatever time it was, it was always crazy early. And, you know, you'd go for a nice long run and then do a full workout or something like that. Um, we had numerous track workouts that I'm sure uh, stories have been told about. But for me, the ones I always hated the most were the pool workouts. You know, you would get in there and they'd usually split us up into teams kind of to make it a little bit more competitive. And just for whatever reason, all the good swimmers were put on one side and all of us guys that can't really float were on the other side and they must have finished every workout aspect or exercise in half the time we did. And I remember one of them was you'd have to swim across the pool with a hoodie on while the rest of your team is treading water half and half on each side. And then you'd have to take the hoodie off, give it to another guy all while in the water and then go back and, I swear, I thought our team, we were going to have a couple of guys go down because we, we were really struggling. But, you know, as much as they sucked, and they really did suck at the time, once you were done, uh, you were definitely tighter as a group just knowing what you'd gone through together. But, yeah, I'm, I'm glad uh, those are long in my rearview window. I think, and multiple guys have said this too, when they now, you know, whether it's going into training camps, whether it was in NHL or Europe, a lot of these guys go, there is nothing that can phase me because I've seen the hardest of hard in terms of like what those workouts were. And like so many stories, like, uh, two guys explained another pool one where it was like, you had to hold a brick or something above or something, have a weight above maybe. And like guys are treading water and, um, yeah, it's, uh, they throw things at you that you wouldn't really expect. And, uh, usually it's, it's quite hard and, um, yeah, it definitely prepared me for, uh, training camps at the professional level um you know obviously the, the skill and and the speed of the game increases but any any kind of conditioning thing uh nothing really uh came close to what we what we had to do at union and speaking of kind of just preparing you so you know we mentioned we've gone kind of through your first three years there you guys have been really building steam there and then you know going into your senior year um you know First and foremost, and one thing I want to talk about later is, you know, you, you end up being the captain of the team. Um, did you feel anything different about going into that season? Like, did or and like, was there belief in that dressing room being like, 
we have a legit chance of, you know, being national champions this year? Um, I don't think that was really brought up a whole lot. So, you know, my freshman year, I'll just take it back a little bit. We, we had a really good team. And that was the first year union had won the league and we got bounced from the playoffs, uh, in an upset, uh, overtime game three, we lost, we still made the tournament. And then we lost two nothing to the national champions that year, uh, Minnesota Duluth. But I felt like we were kind of just happy to be a part of it, you know? Um, and then the next year we made it to the frozen four and we, that year, I, I thought that was the team. We, we had uh, we were really strong down the middle with our centers. Um, you know, we, we ended up losing to uh, Ferris, I believe, uh, at the frozen four. But looking back, I, I, I would have said that sophomore year was probably the year that we would get it done. Um, our junior year, it was uh, a lot more adversity than our group had faced the first two years of college. Uh, we actually had to win uh, the conference tournament to, to make the tournament itself, which we were able to do. Um, and then, you know, you lose pretty quickly again. I, I think we won one game and then lost the next to, I believe it was Quinnipiac that year we lost to. So we, we had gone through the stages of the tournament. Um, and I would say from that second year on, we, we always talked about wanting to be national champions, but it wasn't something that we brought up on a day-to-day -day basis or anything like that. And quite honestly, like we didn't get off to a very good start that year. Uh, I think we were one, two, and two after five games. Uh, Troy Grossnick had, had left uh, to sign pro or a year early. Uh, Juris had signed, uh, signed the pro contract a year early. So we lost a couple big parts too. And, you know, after those first five games, I think guys were like, oh, we could be in one here. So we were able to turn it around. And obviously uh, the storybook ending there. I remember watching that game and, you know, just to see it happen, like I can only imagine the feeling, you know, because as you said, like you guys had been through so much, like those spring workouts. Um, there was other years where you felt like maybe we should have won it that year. And then, you know, this year you guys had had a slower start, but it must have been just kind of like, a, you know, as you say, kind of a storybook ending to end your college career. You know, you go out a champion, which not many people can say and just talk about you know that that run and then evidently you know being able to put the trophy above your head at the end yeah i mean the, the goals that year was to to win our uh a regular season championship uh, win the tournament championship for the conference and then to be national championships uh we actually hit all three of those which i think is pretty special in the in the college level because you know, 16 teams get in. Usually there's only, what, five, I think it's five conferences, might be six now in college hockey. So there's a good chance someone is going to win that's not a, a, a conference champion, right? So, um, yeah, it, it was a, a wild ride. Uh, we really just took it one game at a time. And then that, that Minnesota game was just – it was – probably the most wild first period I've ever been a part of. They, they scored early on us. We were able to tie it up on a nice move by Ghost. And then they got another one uh, pretty quickly. And then we banged in three ones late. And I remember sitting in the locker room thinking like, geez, I don't think we've blown a two goal lead all year. And it's four, two and guys' minds are racing. And then they score, I think first shift of the, of the second to make it four, three. So it was a real uh, back and forth affair, but uh you know, I, I think we, we kind of had that quiet confidence that, all right, we're in control here moving forward and uh, obviously able to get that 7-4 win. At the end of the day, they don't ask, uh, like, how? They just ask how many, and you guys are able to get, you know, a national championship, as I said. And um, I'm curious, when you're going through this, kind of these tournament stages too, like you yourself, if you, I'm sure you had already in previous seasons, but you must be getting a lot of, you know, NHL interest, you know, they are obviously heavily scouting this tournament, you know, following guys that have, you know, been doing really well. And as you said, whether it's, you you know, you could be a sophomore, junior, senior, like, you know, if you're playing well, these teams are going to try to offer you to get you to leave. And, you know, for yourself, like, were you talking to multiple teams, like kind of throughout this, or did you just kind of turn your uh, mind off and was like, I want to focus on this until, you know, I'm done. 
Yeah, I pretty much uh, let my uh, advisor kind of deal with that. Um, you know, once uh, once every year gets started, that's really all you're focusing on is that that season, and that's kind of how we play it out. Um, luckily, I was you know able to play kind of with a free mind, knowing there was some interest, and you know things worked out being able to sign with the, the Rangers after the season, but. Uh, it's not really something that was on my mind. I, I'm sure it affects some guys a little bit more, but uh, just the way things were going that year, you know, we were having such a good time. You know, it's your last ride as a senior, and we just wanted to be in the moment, and I think we all did a pretty good job of that. And when you're, like, you mentioned you end up signing with the Rangers there, which is obviously a great organization, but had, were there other organizations that you were t that kind of were offering you as well? And, like, if so, like, how did you – you know, kind of pick out of the group? Uh, they, they were the most interested for sure. Um, and it, it just kind of seemed like a, a good fit, you know, looking at the rosters, uh, you know, both American League and, and the NHL kind of saw an opportunity to, to play. And, uh, you know, it, it worked out pretty well. I had a pretty good uh, stint in Hartford there. And, uh, you know, definitely uh, grateful that they gave me that opportunity. Before we talk about your jump there to the AHL in Hartford, I wanted to ask quickly, what did you end up uh, taking in school and graduating in? A uh, degree in economics with a math minor. So whenever uh, the hockey ride's done, uh, might turn over the business world, but you know we'll, we'll see when whenever that comes. Not a bad degree to have. So uh, you're sitting on some gold there, I think. But um, back to your hockey career. So again, like as you said, you end up going – to the Rangers organization and obviously they at the time and I believe they still are now are affiliated with Hartford so how was that uh that first year for you like again like we we talked about when you went to college like coincidentally you have the same amount of points and I read something in hockey analytics that it was like their first year of OHL major junior or NCAA should be their first year as well of pro for them to be a consistent player and you literally put up 32 points in, in both of those. So how was the, the jump for you, you know, getting uh, used to that kind of lifestyle, you know, it's obviously fun, but at the same time a grind, cause there are weekends when you're playing three and threes and on the bus all the time, et cetera. Uh, yeah, it was pretty eye opening. Um, you know, we were, we had a, a fun group in Hartford that year, uh, a lot of characters on the team, the different personalities and, um, so it made it fun. Um, but I think the biggest difference between pro and, uh, you know, college hockey for me at the time was at union, I'm sure a lot of schools have this as well. It was all about, you know, the team, the team goal, just winning. And definitely at the pro level in the American league level, there, there's that selfish side of like, I want to be the call up. Right. So you, you definitely see some of those colors come out and, you know, everybody's at this point, this is your job, this is your livelihood. Everyone wants to make that jump to the NHL, but it was, it took me some time to kind of realize like, all right, like it, you want to win as a team, but there's definitely some personalities in that room that are thinking about themselves a little bit more than uh, I'd been used to at the, the college and even junior levels for sure. That must be, you know, hard for, I would say players, but also like coaches, right? Because the coaches, you know, put a game plan together every day and they're, you know, obviously it's for the more of the benefit of the team, but you could have guys who are like, you know, this is great, but I'm trying to get called up here. So I need to put up points or I need to play my role a little more. So, and that is very true, especially about that. I think the East coast and AHL, like it is, uh, you know, more selfish and, and, and the turnover is, is crazy like just looking at your roster like every year you know every team's got you know 50 50 guys coming in and out just whether it's injuries trades or you know giving a guy a weekend kind of thing there's there's a reason why they call it the farm system right because yeah you're, you're really just kind of piece of the puzzle for the big club um and you know in the american league locker room you're going to have guys that are first rounders that are going to get every opportunity you're going to have guys that you know, have already played a lot of NHL games and maybe on the tail end of their career. You're going to have uh, some guys just looking to crack the American League lineup. So you got a lot of different uh, career timelines all kind of mashed into one. And, uh, you know, we were, we were able to go on a, a bit of a playoff run that year. We lost in the conference finals. But you, you got to come together as a group and, 
you know, put some of those uh, selfish individual goals aside for the better of the group to, to kind of have success at that level, I think. And one thing, one another thing I thought was pretty cool and just like hearing you talk about it, it's pretty clear why, but you know, your second year of pro, you end up getting named captain of the team, which I think is, you know, a true testament to your character, but at the same time, like a very cool feat, like so young in terms of young into your pro career. Um, had you kind of seen that coming or what did that kind of catch you by surprise? Um, yeah, I mean, maybe a little bit for sure being, you know, uh, a relatively new pro, but, uh, you know, being, being a captain, something I've had a lot of experience with kind of growing up and then through junior and college there. So wasn't uh, a big shock, um, definitely an honor. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think any captain changes the way they act, whether they have a letter on their jersey or not. You know, that's kind of a cliche, but I think it really does hold true. Um, but, yeah, it's uh, definitely something looking back on you can be proud of. But, you know, we had, we had a good group of guys, good leadership group, and could have, could have been a few different guys for sure. So I was just uh, lucky that coach saw something in me, and that's kind of it. <laughs> so so modest. Um... Before we continue with the hockey career, like you, we've just talked about it a bit now, and I think it's a good point. I wanted to bring it up later, but it seems more probably now. Like you've worn a, a letter multiple times in in your career, whether you know it was in college, pro at different uh, levels, countries, uh, as I said, captain or even assistant captain. And I'm just, I think it's good for the maybe the listeners to hear, like someone like yourself, you know, how do you go about that kind of on a day to day basis? Like what you know, how is it that Matt Bodie, you know, tries to lead, you know, what are maybe your fundamentals that you believe are, are key to being, being a leader? I think uh, the first one would just be, um, it's all about the team, right? Like, you know, definitely as, as you get older, um, you realize how, how awesome it is to be part of a group, whether it's a hockey team or, a different sports team or a company, whatever it is, like we're all going after the same thing. You know, we all want to win a championship. We all want to be the best pro we can be, make it to that next level. And to be able to do that with a group of guys, I think it's a pretty special thing. So um, first and foremost, I would just say never put yourself ahead of the team. Um you know, you, you always have a, a few guys that are very skilled that might not wear a letter, but I think you look at some of those guys that maybe don't have the skill, but they're just working hard and you really respect them because they're doing whatever it can just to help you win. So you want that guy next to you. Um, and then just be yourself. People, people see through if you're trying to act a, a specific way, just be yourself, go have fun and Hopefully the guys respect you for it. And I think too, another, like that was a, first of all, that was a very, very true and honest point. Um, especially about the last part, like you, you have to be yourself for it to, I think for it to really hold in the dressing room and for guys to respect it. But would you say in terms of yourself, because I think there's different types of leadership, you know, there's, you know, a guy who's vocal in the dressing room, a guy who's first on the ice, last off every day, and maybe a quiet leader that just works his ass off. But, you know, when the time is needed, he will say the odd thing. Like, what type of leader would you say you are? And how did you build, you know, those traits? Because it's not, you know, as much as it is something you're kind of born with at times, you do have to get comfortable doing it, too. It's not just something that you can turn a switch on and be. Yeah, for sure. Um I would say I, I could be a vo one of the vocal leaders, uh, not necessarily a raw, raw guy, but, you know, someone who, who's saying whatever needs to be said. And I think part of that is, you know, if in your mind something needs to be said to, to help the group out, you got to say it, whether you're comfortable or not, because if you're not saying it, maybe the next guy doesn't say it. I really think uh, talking is contagious. Um, you know, one guy starts talking in the locker room, next guy starts talking, next thing you know, you kind of got that energy in the room back, you know, whether it's in the middle of a period or intermission and maybe the last period didn't go your way. You got to, got to find a way to come back. And so I'd say vocal, but 
And then also, uh, you know, you want to lead by example on the ice. And I don't think that's necessarily skill I'm talking about, but more so how you're playing. You know, you want to play hard, you know, take a hit to make a play, block a shot to, to help the goalie out. So I would say it's doing like the, the things that necessarily aren't fun, but are going to help the team win. You got to be doing those things too, to, to be a good leader. Yeah, listen up, kids, because that's uh couldn't be better said, and is is very true. You know, basically play the right way, do everything the right way. You know, that's as you said, you don't have to be the most skilled guy out there, but you know, hard work, giving the extra every day, doing the little things. Um, and I think that's a big reason why someone like yourself has, you know, been a leader on multiple occasions, and and even now in in English that I, you know, you may not wear a letter, but at the same time, you know. I definitely can see you being a guy in the room who, as you said, can be vocal if the guys need it and, and, you know, everyone will listen, but back to your, uh, back to your playing career now, after that great insight on, on leadership, I wanted to ask you, and this is such a, a hard question to ask without it sounding, uh, negative, but you know, you end up playing four years there in the AHL, uh, a couple, a couple of different teams. And I'm just curious, like you, you're a guy consistent, like you're, you're as a D, you know, you're putting up, you know, 30 to 40 points every year and you're just not getting that, that chance to, you know, take the the next step to the top level, you know, the NHL, every kid's dream. Like, was that, would you say that was frustrating for you at times or you just kind of put your head down and just kept working and didn't really focus on it? Uh, both for sure. Um, definitely frustrating because, you, you know, you feel you feel like you not necessarily deserve that opportunity, but you feel like you're capable of getting that opportunity. Um, like you said, I, I thought I was a pretty consistent player in the American league and, you know, thought uh, I, I'd be able to, you know, at least show what I can offer at the next level. Um, things never happened for me there, but, you know, I was definitely lucky to, to be a pro hockey in North America and, you know, I, I can honestly say I kind of gave my best shot and uh, still made a, a pretty decent career playing hockey for, for a living. So I, ca I can't be too upset. And after that, uh, that last year there in North America and Syracuse, you know, again, as we talked about, you end up putting up the most, the most points you had in the AHL. And at the end of that season, like, were you just kind of like, you know what? I've given, I've given it all. This has been great, but you know, I'd like to go try something else and go to Europe and you end up evidently signing in the KHL. Yeah. Um, I kind of remember that, that off season, I was kind of looking for a bit of a change. Um, the, the three teams I'd played for in the American league were all East coast based teams. So, you know, I, you, you played in the same rinks, um, you play in the three and threes, riding the bus. So, my goal was to kind of maybe try the West coast of the American league or, you know, overseas. And uh, when the opportunity to go overseas to KHL came, you know, I, I thought it was a good, good opportunity. And uh, you know, that's what I ended up choosing. And how was your experience there? Cause obviously, you know, now anyone listening would be like, Oh my God, this guy was in, in Russia and obviously everything's going there. But like, how was, you know, the, the city, your experience with the team, the culture, the travel, everything like that. It was good. Yeah. Mostly good. Um, we had a good group of guys, uh, you know, over there, it's kind of, you, you're with your import guys more than say some of the Russian teammates, but you know, for the most part the Russians were very welcoming and, uh, we had a fun year. Um, personally, uh, I actually broke three bones over there. So I got to see a few different uh, Russian hospitals, which not quite the same as what we had experienced over in North America, but uh, you know, that's just part of the game as well. Uh, it was just kind of unfortunate uh, blocking a couple shots, broken finger, broken ankle. And then uh, I took a hit and uh, broke some ribs. So it, it wasn't the most fun year uh, medically, but you know, when uh when I was playing it was fun. It was it was fun to travel, uh see some different places and uh I look back on it uh, with some good memories. Were you ever nervous going to those those hospitals, you know, because as you said, you're you're the one one of maybe three or four imports in in Russia and probably having a translator go with you? Yeah, I, I mean I remember the first time I go down and you can't even really tell the building I'm entering is a hospital and 
like the lights are kind of flickering and it seems like we're in some sort of basement. Um, all the, uh, the bookkeeping was actually being done on books, not on computers. So I'm thinking like, man, where am I? But you know, everything healed up. Okay. So, so they must've been doing the, the, the right stuff over there for me. So it's, it's, it's funny, but, uh, you know, things worked out, I guess. No mutations or malfunctions yet in the body. So yeah, so. but there's still time. <laughs> um, and then after that season, you end up going to to Sweden. You know, you play in the SHL there, which is another great league, uh, top league in Sweden. There, um, how was that compared to the the KHL? Like, how would you describe the levels? Maybe the and maybe the hockey as well. Uh the the level of hockey is probably pretty similar. Um, but the style of hockey is very different, right? Like Sweden, there's a lot more puck possession, uh, a lot more kind of turning back. If, if you don't like what you see, um, I would say maybe the, the individual skill levels a little bit higher in the KHL. Um, but it's more, more of a free flowing game. Uh, guys are taking you on one-on-one, -on -one. um, you, you know, looking back on the KHL, it, it, was, it was good uh, defensive development for myself, for sure, because you're playing. I remember, I think at one of our first games, might have been the first game, uh, we were playing Datsuk's team at the time. And at this point, he's late 30s. And uh, I remember the first shift, we had all five imports on, and he was out, and my D partner went in the corner, and that suit made a nice move, comes out of the corner untouched, makes a backdoor pass, and we're just like, all right, we're in one, boys. But, you know, you learn to play the game a little differently uh, away from the puck. So I think it was good. And then uh, in the Swedish league, everyone everyone there is a great skater. Um, but I, I'd say there's maybe not as much uh, creativity as there was in the KHL for sure. And what led you – and? I wonder, I have a second thought to this, but after this season, you know, obviously playing, as you just said, like a really fast, well skating league in, in Sweden, what led you kind of decide, Hey, I, I want to give Germany a shot. And I wondered because, you know, your one of your union teammates, Wayne Simpson, uh, had been at English dad already played there the year before, like, you know, were you talking to him and he was kind of telling you like, you know, great things that English dad was doing, obviously they've been building the past couple of years and been very competitive, you know, did he kind of speak good things to you? And that was kind of the maybe deciding factor. Yeah. So we, we kept in touch post uh, college as well. Um, we just, you know, played against him in the American league a few times. And then uh, he came over, like you said, into English that year before I got there. Um, that was actually the COVID year the, when I first came. So, you know, I was just kind of sitting around. I think everyone's kind of, a little unsure of what the next move is. Uh, some leagues are starting, some aren't. Um, so that, that played a factor in it for sure. You know, getting, getting to a spot and playing some hockey that year. And, uh, you know, luckily was able to live in the same uh, building as, as Simmer. So it's been uh, pretty fun four years for us. Yeah. And I'm sure during those, uh, those COVID times, you know, obviously you weren't allowed to do too much. So I, I'm sure you guys were spending a lot of nights together and that kind of, you know, probably was good for your, both of your guys' mental health. Cause you know, as you said, when you got there, that was kind of the, the first full year of two where there was, you know, a lot of rules, vaccinations were just coming out, you know, you couldn't really fully experience German culture, which, you know, a lot of these cities can offer just because of the COVID. Yeah, for sure. Um, me and my wife, we actually tested positive for COVID coming off the flight. So we had a, a two week quarantine uh, to start our time in Germany. So um, I didn't get off to the best start. But then, like, yeah, as you said, uh, we, we did have a lot of nights with the Simpsons. Uh, like, like I said, living right, right in the same building as them. Because uh, at the time, like you weren't allowed to go to restaurants that year. And there wasn't a whole lot going on other than, you know, going to the rink and playing hockey. So um i definitely think it was a lot easier on the guys and the girls that season and you mentioned too you know you're going into your fourth year there um obviously a lot of comfortability but i as i said before like you guys you know this year obviously i think you guys are gonna climb up the standings for sure but the past couple of years you guys have been a, a team to be reckoned with like we talk about in the dl you know everybody talks about you know the 
the teams like the Mannheims, the Colognes, and the Berlins, who, you know, have been dominant for so many years. But now it's, you know, the English dads are consistent every year. And, and you know, you guys evidently went to the finals last year. Like, talk about talk about that run. And and one thing I wanted to comment, too, on that finals run is you end up having a very young goalie in at, at the end who played very well um, with, uh, I believe his name is Jonas Stebmer there. Um, just kind of talk about that experience. You know, it seems like every team you've been on, you guys are getting to the finals, you know, whether it was in college, whether it was in Powell River and now in the DEL. Yeah, you know, I've been lucky to go on a couple deep playoff runs. Um, they definitely don't happen every year, but uh, when when they do, you can kind of feel it. Um, you know, last year we, we just kind of clicked at the right time. Um, we were a, a really resilient group. We had a lot of injuries throughout the season, and we just kind of kept finding our way through it. Um, then we came away healthy to start the playoffs, uh, fairly, fairly handily won the first round, but we ended up losing our starting goalie, um, going into the second round. So our backup was playing the second round against Mannheim and he played great. We were able to, to take them out in six and then he had some, uh, you know, some health issues in the final. So like you said, we were down our third string goalie and. He actually got the only win for us in uh, in the finals. We, we unfortunately lost four one to Munich, but uh, yeah, it's it's just one of those things like kind of next man up mentality in pro hockey or pro sports. And uh, you know, all the all the goalies kind of answered the bell when it was their turn. And uh, we came up a little short, but uh, you know, again, you look back on it and uh, it'll, you got some great memories going forward. I was happy for for Stepmer there being a young kid, but uh, I also wanted to say I was at your game, maybe game four in Mannheim when you guys won one nothing, and it just like Kevin Reich just he's got Mannheim's number, like he just always finds a way, he always plays well against them, and then that game gets a gets a shutout. But yeah, crazy to say that you guys you know went through three goalies in that playoff run and still found a way to get to the final. So I think that just kind of shows to. Again, kind of your group, you know, very resilient, uh, kind of came together there at the right time. How many would you say, you know, I know you have a contract this year and I believe next year, like how many more years would you say you want to play or are you just kind of taking it year by year and seeing how, you know, it is with the family after and also the body? Yeah, um, I, th I think you've kind of said the whole answer there in the question. Uh, I, I would take it year by year kind of going forward. Uh, and then the, the two biggest factors are the family and the body, how it holds up. Uh, you know, is it, I broke the finger in the playoffs last year. Um, I actually tore a tricep in the final. So you, you feel some of these injuries kind of not healing quite as fast or as quite as well. And then, uh, you know, my kids are, you know, getting to the age where they're going to start school. So kind of be a family decision on, on where they're going to school, whether it be here right now, they're, they're going to kindergarten, uh, like German kindergarten. So learn the language, with, which I think is great, but you know, at a certain point, I think, uh, the family side will probably pull you back, but, um, still loving the game, still, uh, getting the opportunity to play a lot. So uh, as long as the love of the game is still there, I, I think you'll still see me out there. And how would you say, like, you do such a good job at juggling it? Because, you know, as you said, you have the hockey side of it, you know, going to the rink every day, whether it's for three, four hours, giving everything you got, and then coming home and, you know, you don't just have one kid or two, you have three, and then obviously helping out your wife as well. So how do you balance the kind of the sport professional life and then also the family life and kind of have energy for both? Yeah, I think you kind of keep them separate a little bit. Um, obviously, if things are going well at home, you're probably going to be playing better on the ice. So you, you make sure things are, are going well at home first. Um, obviously, my wife's awesome. She's been great uh, kind of transitioning from having no kids and, and being married to a pro hockey player to having now three and, and kind of keeping my routines the same, which, you know, sometimes isn't, isn't possible. But for the most part, she does – a great job kind of handling the home front and letting me really focus on the game. And then, uh, you know, at the rink, just never taking it for granted. Um, you never know when it could be the last, last game, last shift, last season. So every time you're there, just in, enjoy it. And, uh, good seems kind of good things kind of seem to happen when that, when, when you do that. 
two very awesome points there obviously first about your wife you know great support system at home um obviously you know in hockey you guys are at the rink a lot on the road a lot so she's you know keeping the house all together and obviously keeping things running with the family and then like you mentioned like the the hockey thing so many people go to the rink every day and just think yeah this you know I'll do this again tomorrow and kind of take that feeling for granted and from being someone that's not playing anymore I can tell you you know I wish I didn't take that for granted or think it'll always be there because you know and someone like yourself you've had a very good long career and you know you're soaking every minute in which is good um wanted to ask you too about your brother like we brought him up kind of at the start you kind of followed him throughout his career there I see him junior in college but uh just talk about that relationship with him and kind of you know what he's meant to you throughout your life yeah he's been huge um literally everywhere from let's say four or five years old until college I, I was following him um wherever he had played I would be at that same team in in kind of two years time we're, we're two years apart um and then able to finally play a full season with him in junior. Uh, I think he was huge in helping me make the transition away from living at home with my parents to living with billets and, uh, you know, being four provinces away. And so he, he was huge in the junior uh, transition then huge in the college transition as well. And, uh, you know, I, I think I've just been very fortunate to kind of have him by my side uh throughout most of my hockey career and even now you know he's still giving me pointers on on my games and uh you know he's a coach in the bchl so we're talking strategy and um yeah it's just been uh great to have uh someone that you can bounce everything at work or at hockey off of and uh, he's he's been huge for my career for sure he's really done well as well you know kind of you know juggling his you know real estate and then also the the coaching as well and you know I can honestly say you know playing one year with him that he was a very smart guy and understood the game and I could definitely have seen him getting into coaching down the road which he ended up doing and uh, also a fun guy to spend nights with you know a little little after dark so uh, I'm sure that runs in the in the Bodie family but um you mentioned before a uh, couple more here as you as we mentioned you're a dad so you need to you know have your you time now as you said the kids are asleep so you want to get rejuvenated for tomorrow but um you mentioned the economics degree there um is that so whenever the time does come for you to you know hang up the skates like is it something you want to do in terms of what you have a degree in or would you maybe want to stay in in hockey and work on that side whether it's coaching management etc um yeah that's definitely a thought of mine um i, I think uh, coaching would be a uh, pretty fulfilling uh path um always enjoyed talking about the game and uh, having the, the relationships with the teammates so you know I don't think coaching is for everybody but I, I think uh I think personally I, I I would enjoy it um but you know it's a competitive field um and again the the family aspect comes into it because you know it, the life of a coach can be tough. It can be challenging. You know, the job security is not quite there the same as, you know, maybe something in the corporate world. And, um, you know, I've been moving my family around for X number of years now. So, um, like I said, I'll kind of take things year by year and see what happens. But I, if I was a betting man, I could definitely see myself coaching in the future. So uh, I think it's good to stay involved in the game, give back, whether it's, you know, at the pro level, junior level calls up, or even the minor hockey level, you know, I'm sure your kids will be in hockey one day um, or at least give it a shot. So it'll be good to have someone like yourself, their dad to, to show them the ropes. Um, when you look back on your career and obviously it's still going, um, did you think you would, you would have the career that you've had when you look back? Um, no, I, I guess not. Um, growing up, the goal was kind of always to get to college hockey and get the degree. Um, you know, my my parents, my dad specifically, always said, you know, you want to keep your options open. And I figured, you know, going to school while still playing hockey was a good way to do that. And, um, you know, I never thought I was going to play pro for as long as I have. And now you – 
you don't want to take it for granted, but it just kind of seems like it's your norm. And, you know, everyone goes through it or at, at one point you're done playing. So, you know, for these last however many years, I'm just going to enjoy every, every minute and uh, have fun while, while I'm still playing the game for, for a living. So, um, yeah, looking back, just been very fortunate. Awesome to hear that. And, and like you said, just, enjoy it while it lasts man because it's uh you know i tell everyone play as long as they can but obviously as you've mentioned it's multiple factors come into every decision with that um last one here i'd like to end with all the guests here what is one piece of advice or multiple piece of advice you would give your younger self and also maybe the younger generation listening so if you were speaking to matt Bodie, 16 17 18 years old what are one or multiple piece of advice you would give him um, you know, I, I don't know if I can look back and say what I would give myself advice, but for, for someone else, uh, I would definitely say, uh, playing, playing the game, make sure at whatever level you're at, you're actually playing. Don't be in a rush to get to that next level. Uh, I think that suited me very well in my career. Um, I had the chance to go to junior earlier than I did. I had a chance to go to college earlier than I did um, and even pro earlier. But, you know, I, I waited until I really felt I was ready to take that next step and I felt I could play at that next level. And I think that benefited me really well where I know a lot of friends of mine maybe took off a little bit early, maybe too early to the WHL and their, their career didn't quite pan out as, as much as they would like. So my advice would just be, make sure you're playing at whatever level you're at and then move on to the next when you're ready. That's great advice. Um, as you mentioned, I, and I've seen it too. So many people are so focused on the next level that they're not finishing the level they're at, you know, like becoming, whether it's an expert or having true success at that level, because they're thinking, yeah, I got to get as high as I can as fast as possible, which obviously isn't, uh, the right answer. And for development is, is the wrong way to do it because, um, you can go play higher levels, but if you're playing three minutes at that level and the level you were before you're playing 20 minutes, 25 minutes, where are you going to develop more? So I think that's very good advice from you. Um, so come to the end here. I appreciate the, appreciate you taking the time and obviously, you know, us being in the same, same league. Now we're going to be seeing each other around the rinks. I think we're, uh, we're there after the November break. Um, any plans for November break? Uh, just going to Kinder Resort with the family. So let the kids have some fun. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we've been to a couple before and they're good for the family as well. And uh, enjoy a few days there. Somewhere in Germany or somewhere else? Uh, Austria. Okay. Nice. I think well, uh, I think somebody on my team was talking about that too, taking their kids there um, in Austria. I'm not sure where, but that sounds fun. But, uh, Again, man, I appreciate you taking the time. And uh, to be honest, like just listening to you speak, like it's pretty clear, like why you've had the career you've had, the success and, you know, why you've been a leader. Um, you know, in my bio, I'm going to write, you know, I run through a wall for you because it's just everything you talked about is just so, uh, so true. And uh, again, appreciate you taking the time. Good luck this year, uh, except against Mannheim. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be seeing you around the rink. Awesome. Thanks for having me. And for those listening, Give us a follow if you haven't. Check uh, the live one on YouTube as well. And until next week, cheers and ciao.